Okay, good evening. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to tonight's C-State Lecture. This is sponsored by the, uh, uh, better make sure I get this right, by the Morton Kelly Charitable Trust, who are the uh, generous sponsors for, the, uh, for our C-State Lecture Series. Uh, so, uh, my name is Andrew Pershing. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer here at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, so I run our, uh, our research program. Uh, our research program is focused on understanding the Gulf of Maine ecosystem from top to bottom, or as I like to say, from physics to fish sticks. So trying to go all the way from the physical properties of the ecosystem up to people and economics and, and the things that, uh, uh, that people really care about. Um, but we combine that knowledge, unlike um, uh, other science institutions, we really try to combine that knowledge with uh, uh, with, an, with an intention to make that knowledge useful. And our community team, which is our uh, second pillar of our, of our programs, is, no, uh, is our important partner on that. Our community programs works with the fishing industry, works with coastal communities, uh, and works with the, the fishery management councils to try to uh, improve the sustainability and the health of the Gulf of Maine, both for the people and for uh, the ecosystem. And then we have our, uh, our education program uh, that occupies this wonderful space here where we bring 10,000 students each year uh, and give them authentic science experiences uh, and send them off into the world, hopefully motivated and informed uh, and ready to go out and be science leaders. Um, so it is my privilege to introduce uh, Gail Bownis, who has uh, been at GMRI for almost 12 years. Uh, and Gail is really unique in that Gail has not only a degree in marine biology, but Gail also has degrees uh, in education. She has a master's in uh, the science of, or I'm sorry, in ecological teaching uh, from Lesley University uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts. And Gail has uh, began her career at GMRI working with our education program uh, on the, the program that runs here in the Cohen Center and in some of the programs that we've, we've been delivering to public schools. Um, but she has now transitioned in and is now actually part of our community team uh, and is running the, the Sea Level Rise project that she's gonna talk about tonight. And I think that's a really, a really exciting theme that, that hopefully you're gonna hear more and more from us. Uh, as we go on, we're really trying to develop projects that take advantage of the capacity that we have on science, education, and community all in one building and really trying to find places where we can, where we can work together uh, and point those, uh, that, that uh, knowledge and experience towards outcomes. So I'm very excited to introduce Gail who's gonna talk about uh, sea level rise. in here though, so I'll um, turn it down. Okay, we're good. All right, a little bit more? Thank you. Um, so it's really exciting to see some adults in this space instead, nice change of pace. So. Thank you very much for taking the time out of a beautiful evening. Can you guys still hear me okay back there? I know, I know, it's feedback. All right, we good? Okay, thank you. Um, so a beautiful evening in Maine. Thanks for choosing to spend an hour with us indoors. Um, so as Andy said, I'm going to share with you a bit about what um, we've been learning as we've been preparing for a sea level rise community education program that we're going to be launching later this summer. Um, and a little bit about what I've been up to for the past 18 months in preparation for that. So 18 months ago, Jim and I received a grant from NOAA um, to develop a program to engage communities in thinking about sea level rise and how it's going to be impacting the people and the places that live along the coastline. And we're specifically focused for this part of the project um, in the greater Portland area. So that's where most of my stories and data will come from today. But we do have data about sea level rise up and down the coast and, and for this project up and down the coast of Maine too. So, we're viewing it as a prototype that could expand down the road. So kind of a neat part about being at GMRI for so long is I've seen lots of programs come and go and I've gotten to focus in and learn about lots of different things along the way. So I had a couple years really focused on Atlantic herring and a few years on lobsters, um, even some time thinking about home electricity usage thrown in there. And then for the past 18 months, it's been sea level rise. So I just wanted to share a little bit about kind of how my brain has been thinking about this. Um, so the view from where my desk is up on the third floor out at the Portland Harbor 
And if ever I see a little bit of wind or it looks choppy out there, I'm like, huh, I wonder what this, how is this impacting the data, the data of the tides? That's what you see here in the middle. So don't worry too much about interpreting the graphs. We're going to dig into those a little bit later. But that's kind of where my brain's going when I'm seeing different effects on the, on the water is what's happening to the tides out there. So this is actually just two days ago. Um, it was rainy because it's June and Maine. Um, and there is, that red line is showing you what the tidal level actually was. The blue line is what we predicted it to be. So that difference that you're seeing is an impact of the weather on the tides up there. So just a little bit of rain and wind that we had earlier this week on a misty day impacted the tidal level. A week prior to that, you may have seen um, that we were experiencing spring tides. So if you were along the coastline, you're like, huh, the tide looks unusually high today. Well, it actually was. So that happens a few times a year when everything is in alignment just right and the gravitational forces are just a little bit stronger and we see higher tides. On average, our high tide level is around 10 feet, but last week we were seeing tidal levels of 12 feet. And plus, we've been having a rainy June, so it was even a little bit higher. Now in Portland, our flood stage is 11.8 feet. So, hmm, why didn't we hear so much about this in the press? Well, this just happened to happen on a weekend and in the middle of the night. So we still experienced all that same flooding that we get with um, big events that you hear people talk about, like King Tide, but it didn't happen at a time that was inconvenient for us. All right, so I mentioned King Tide, so let's look at that graph really quickly. There we go. So this is just down um, the ways here, one of the parking lots on the Portland waterfront. And the flood stages exceeded that 11.8 feet. And we saw some tide levels just a little bit higher than 12 feet. And plus, on top of our king tide, we had a little bit of rain that was happening and some onshore wind. So this is a little bit of flooding that occurred, which also occurred last week in the middle of the night, but we didn't know about it. So. This is what I've been thinking about as I've been driving across the bridge to come to work or if I take my kids to the beach or just looking out the office window. And this is something that I hope that you guys think about after um, you leave here tonight when you're looking out at the water is, huh, that's an unusually high tide. I wonder why. What else is going on? Is there a weather effect, um, weather thing that's impacting that, that tidal level? So I hope that's kind of how your brain starts to work a little bit too as we're thinking about our water and what's going to be the new normal. So you were here to discuss sea level rise. It's not something that just started happening today. It's something that's been happening for a long time. So I'm curious to hear from you all. What are some of the impacts or effects of sea level rise that you may have been noticing in your communities? Yeah? One of the men that mows the lawns commented that he's finally seeing it down there. Oh, wow. Lower areas on some of the lower properties. Great. So with really high tides, you're seeing that high tide mark creep up onto lawn space with the seaweed. Yeah? Guy, 30 years ago, or eight years ago, I lived on Pond Cove in Cape Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and there was quite a bit of land on the seaward side of uh, Shore Drive at that time, and a lot of that has disappeared. Now. Yeah. Yep. And we'll look at some maps that'll, you'll see a little bit more there, too. Right, so loss of land in places that we, we know well. Any other impacts of sea level rise that you have noticed? Okay, yeah? Um, there's a little bit of sea wall beach every now and then. Mm -hmm. and I don't know that it has to do with the sea level rise, but def definitely changes in the rivers and how they meander out into the ocean. And then also the, it appears to me that maybe there's less um, land that the plovers have to nest on. Right. Yeah, so we're going to see loss of wildlife habitat with sea level rise. And with more volume of water, it's definitely going to be impacting how that river is behaving in the land, for sure. Yeah? More, perhaps, in the flooding. Great. Yeah. So to explain a bit the picture that you can see on the right here, if you've ever driven past Whole Foods and seen a large puddle on the road, I really suggest you don't drive through it. That is a saltwater puddle. 
And that water is, it's a sunny day, well, kind of cloudy, but it's not raining. So that water is actually coming from ocean water that's filled the storm drains and is flooding the roads. And so that's what we're referring to as nuisance flooding. You might also hear sunny day flooding um, as another term for that too. So it's flooding that we're seeing because of extreme high tides, um, but it can happen inland or it can happen because the water is coming off of the coast. It's just because of our infrastructure that is there. Great. All right, so I also have a beach picture up here too. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of beach at high tide. So I think something that all of us might be doing not too far down the road is really going to need to check that tidal chart before you head to the beach. There might not be a place for your blanket and it's going to be stiff competition <laughs> at the beaches if you're not there during mid to low tide. All right, we'll take a look at some other impacts that we're seeing. So again, this is some more nuisance flooding right behind um, Jay's Oyster here on Commercial Street. It's kind of a neat picture to look at. You can see the boats and the cars are at the same level on that dock. <laughs> and then if you throw weather into the mix, it all changes again. So with some wind and waves, this is a storm event over here. You can see that the water is coming up over the beach and the dunes and the walls there and creating some inland flooding. And this is the rain event. How, how many of you remember the September 30th, 2015 rain? Yeah. So this, is, this happened pretty suddenly, and it happened on a day like this with extreme high tide. So all those storm drains were already full. And then we got five inches in a really short period of time that rain had nowhere else to go and created a lot of flooding in the Portland area and elsewhere that day. All right, so let's get into what we can expect for sea level rise and look a bit at the data. So globally, sea level has been rising. We've been measuring it and have some pretty consistent data going back to 1880. And looking at this chart, um, the pale yellow is kind of that average rate of rise. Where it's darker yellow into oranges, that's where the rate of rise has actually been greater. And if it's white or blue, the rate of rise has been lower. So when I'm going to be sharing some data with you talking about the average rate of rise globally, you can see that a lot of our places, and up here in the Gulf of Maine where it's darker yellow and a little bit red just outside in the Gulf Stream, the rate of rise is greater than the global average. So I just want you to keep that in mind as we look at some of this global data. So historically, sea level has risen eight inches in the past 100 years. So we can make this assumption that sea level is going to continue to rise at that steady rate for another eight inches in the next 100 years. So what I'm gonna show you here are four different scenarios and this is the lowest scenario. And I just wanna make a note that this is 2012 data um, from NOAA. They just released in January um, a new set of data based off of um, more work that has been done and more things that we now know and it's actually greater, but the models haven't come out and the regulations haven't changed because that takes some time for everybody to absorb that and to do the work. So we're gonna focus on the 2012 data because we have the models to reflect that today. All right, so rate of rise for the past 100 years, eight inches, we can expect that in the next 100 years. That's the lowest case scenario for sea level rise. But we know that our oceans are also getting warmer. They're not just rising, but they're also getting warmer. And when water warms up, it's also going to expand and take up more space. So the mid-low scenario for sea level rise is about 1.6 feet by the year 2100 that we'll see. All right, so ocean temperature is not the only thing that's contributing to sea level rise. The major contributor is actually ice melt. So if you think about all of the ice on land, we've kind of got two varieties. You've got your ice that's floating in the ocean, and then you've got your ice that's landlocked on top of Greenland and Antarctica mostly. So when an iceberg melts, it's not going to contribute to sea level rise because it's already displacing its mass in the oceans. So if you think about sea ice, um, when it's melting, that's not adding to sea level rise, but it may be creating space for ice on land to flow down into the water. And that ice, the ice that's on land, is not displacing its weight. So that's going to contribute to sea level rise. 
Any questions about that? Yeah. Three icebergs, uh, the part that's above the water, mm -hmm. what's that contribute to the water? When um, water freezes, great question. When water freezes, it actually takes up more space than it when it does in a liquid state. So the amount that it's displacing in the water is the volume that that ice will take up when it's water. Yeah, so if you think about like a glass of lemonade with ice cubes out on your table and hot day, when the ice melts, it's not going to change the level of that, of that glass of lemonade, unless you drink some. Um, but <laughs> if it melts and you add more ice, it's going to, going to go up. Just one sec, yeah? Great question. Yeah, so um, sea level has been rising for various reasons. So if you think about our last ice age, we had a lot of ice on land that was pushing the land down because of the weight. As that ice has slowly been melting, our land has been um, kind of rebounding, and that has been adding more water in. So that's been displacing it, plus there's also some plate tectonics going on where you have um, land that's going lower into the water as well. So that's, there's a few different things that have been coming into play with that original eight, eight inches. And that's contributed to the giant. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Was that your question as well, where that eight inches was from? Great. Um, and there's some other factors that are part of that too with um, Rainfall and ocean currents all play, but your two major impacts are going to be the temperature of the water and that melting land ice. Yeah? How are they actually measuring the height of the land and the, the water? Great, so satellites. Um, so there's a satellite that is measuring um, all of that, and it's really neat if you want to Google Earth Potato. Um, you'll see this really cool video of, that's showing you the height of land, and it's not this perfect globe, it's actually different heights around. So that's also the reason why we're seeing different sea levels in different places too. All right, super. So we're not quite to our fourth scenario yet, so I'm going to keep going. Um, so this mid-high scenario is the minimum amount of land ice that scientists predict will melt by 2100, the minimum amount. The maximum amount of ice melt that they predict by 2100 has us up to this highest scenario of 6.6 .6 feet. So that's not all of the ice melting. This is just projecting out to 2100. So we're certain that sea level will rise between 8 inches and 6.6 .6 feet by 2100. It's going to vary from place to place, and it's, a lot of that is depending upon the rate of ice melt. All right. Yeah? Well, and, but haven't the more recent uh, data indicated that it is rising faster? And yes. Faster yeah. Itself? Yeah. So recent data is indicating it's rising faster, and it actually has added an extreme level. I think it's around 8.2 feet. So there's six scenarios in the latest data. Mm -hmm. And the lower one has been bumped up to one foot. Yeah. But this is what we have models for. So the one that I wanted to stick with to share with you today. We'll update as we can. All right, so we're just going to continue on and we're going to see what these layers actually look like in our community. All right, so here's Portland. Um, as I said, our project's been focusing on the greater Portland area and just so that way we have like a good um, perception level, zoom level. I'm just going to focus on the Portland Peninsula. Um, so this is 11.8 feet in 2015, which was the highest annual tide that we saw in, in 2015. So that's kind of the benchmark for thinking about what is this additional levels of sea level going to look like. Uh, and as I mentioned before, 11.8 is the current flood stage here in Portland too. So we're not seeing much impact at 11.8 with the highest annual tide. But if you add one foot of sea level rise onto that, you're going to see events similar to the ones that we looked at before. So you can see up near Somerset Street in Franklin, um, that inland puddle down by Whole Foods. You can see a little bit of flooding around the docks. This is something that um, will occur much more frequently with um, one foot sea level rise up to 90 times a year. 
All right, so two foot sea level rise. Uh, we can see a little bit more extensive flooding happening in the Bayside area and also on Commercial Street. If you want to pop across the harbor, you can see a little bit of flooding happening in South Portland as well. So about half of the high tides over the course of the year will result in flooding that looks like this. So with 3.3 feet sea level rise, and this is that mid-high scenario, so the least amount of land ice melt happening, um, you can see quite a bit of flooding in the Bayside area. If you are noticing that Casco Bay Bridge don't sweat, that's not going to disappear. <laughs> it's just, we're still good. Um, the data is based off of um, where we've had locations of measurement. So no one's measured how high the top of the bridge is for this data set we're looking at. So bridge is still good. <laughs> But to get on to the bridge, that's, that could be a different story. Um, so again, as you can see, your Bayside area is getting a lot of flooding. And when you're looking at this, it's not like, oh no, it's the whole building's underwater. It's not showing us how deep that water is going to be in that area, just that it will be touched by water. And then six feet. So one thing to think about um, with that this is the highest case scenario. So this is not what Portland is, or it's not what Maine is recommended, what we plan for. It's recommended that we plan for that 3.3 foot scenario. But that's on a good day when the weather is nice. So say if you have a storm, like the Patriot Day storm that we experienced, this is the type of flooding that you would have with a 3.3 foot sea level rise um, that you would see. All right, so we've seen some trends. We see Commercial Street underwater. You can see Bayside underwater. And we're going to check out, well, why? So Portland didn't always look the way that it looked. So I'm just going to click through a series of maps. Um, the one coming across is what Portland looked like in 1770. What do you notice? Yeah, 2170, yeah. Great, so the 1770 map really reflects what a six foot sea level rise could be. And if you think about that, the way Portland was built out, the Bayside area and the Commercial Street area are fill. So it originally was water, so it's the first places that the ocean's gonna reclaim as the water comes in. So looking to historic maps like this is a really great way for planners who are looking forward to what are these areas that are going to be most vulnerable to sea level rise. It's a great way for us to really hone in and to best understand the areas that we need to first. So we've been talking about sea level rise um, for the most part thinking about um, a sunny day. So looking at that six foot sea level rise, that is the water gently lapping at the shore. It's not any onshore wind. It's not added precipitation. It's not waves. So let's explore what happens when you add storms into the mix. Um, so as I said before, this program is a little new. We're still playing with some different things. This is a prototype diagram here in the middle, just to show you a little bit about tides. And here in Maine, we're very fortunate to have a big difference between our high tide and our low tide. And, and that's um, how storms interact with that level is going to be really important, and you'll see that here in a bit. So this diagram right now is showing you kind of how our tide varies. It's not the same high tide and the same low tide all the time. It varies throughout the month and it cycles from, like on average, it can, you can see it around like a nine foot high tide, but we can see that 12 foot high tide as well. Like last week when we just had the spring tides. So a lot of this comes down to timing. So we're gonna see what this looks like um, when you throw a storm into the mix. So a storm's going to hit here at low tide, and if you watch the blue line, no one got wet, no one noticed. It's kind of like that super high tide that we had during the middle of the night last week. 
But if it happens during high tide, so the difference between what we're expecting with tides, which we can predict out for decades, um, and what actually happens, that weather impact, that's called your storm tide. So we're going to talk a bit about that in reference to some storms that we've experienced. So a lot of it comes down to timing. And since here in Maine we do have that large difference between our high and low tide, we do have quite a bit of a buffer that's built in. So you can see some impacts of storm on a tide there. We'll talk about that one in just, just a minute. So our benchmark storm is the blizzard of 1978. Uh, we had a 14.3 foot tide that day. Um, I'm not positive what that high tide was. I think it was about a four foot surge that happened. So it was really extreme. Um, you can see the flooding that happened here. So that's our benchmark one. I know that the city is working on um, putting new place marks out so that we, we can really visualize in our place where we have seen water in the past. And that's also, as we already talked about, a really great way to think about where might we see water in the future. Um, so Patriot's Day storm in 2007, um, a lot more recent, probably some more memories from. The big thing about that storm is that it hit during a tide that was on average 10 feet, wouldn't really create any flooding, but it created a surge of a little bit better than three feet on the first day, and then it maintained that surge of a good two feet over six tidal cycles, which you can see on the, on the graphs on the side. So it, it flooded and exceeded flood stages for quite a while. But it's kind of interesting if you look at the graphs, the day that had the most surge wasn't necessarily the highest tide. If it had happened just two tidal cycles later, we would have seen flooding even greater than we did for the blizzard of 78. So it's really a lot about timing and, and having that high difference between high and low tides here in Maine is, is, makes us pretty lucky, a little resilient just naturally. Um, so this one is the rain event um, that we had on September 30th and the reason why that was a big impact is because you can, if you look at the tidal charts on the sides, you can see that already we were at above 10 feet, creeping up on 12 feet. So our storm drains were already full. We were already out, almost at flood stage here in Portland. That water had nowhere else to go. So if you think about storms and sea level rise, as sea levels rising, that bottom part where we're safe when a storm hits, that low tide that creates the buffer for us, is going to go up as well. So if it goes up three feet, six feet, that buffer, that natural bit of resiliency that we have here in Maine because of our tidal difference is going to disappear. So that kind of safe zone that we're in if a storm hits during low tide is going to become less of a chance. And even smaller storms are going to be having greater impacts. So now let's think about how um, sea level rise and storm surge um, may impact our communities and the things that we care about. So all of this is happening, but then how is it really going to be impacting us? <laughs> so Maine's a beautiful place, has a, it's known for its coastline and the things that are around the coast, known for the beaches and the working waterfront, and known for those natural places. So when we're thinking about sea level rise and storm surge and how to best prepare our communities for the future, it's really important to think about what are the resources that we value as a community and how do we want to create resiliency measures around those so we are best preparing those for um, life with higher seas. So what can we do about it? How can we prepare our community to be resilient and to protect those resources that we value? So there's kind of two parts to this. There's mitigation, so reducing our carbon output, but there's also adaptation, too. And there's, like, as I mentioned before, sea level rise is not new. It's been happening for a, a long time, and it's been impacting different places in our world really differently. So this is something that a lot of cities is, have already been dealing with. And there's examples of resiliency around the globe that we can look to as, as um, maybe possibilities for here. But the thing is, it's a really um, kind of a personal solution because it's well, how is your community situated? What are those natural things of, that are making your community resilient, such as those tides? 
what is it that your community values and really wants to protect? What kind of infrastructure do you have and all of that? So it's great to look outwards to those examples, but that solution needs to be um, a personal kind of community thing um, that is created. So let's look and see um, what some others have done. Um, oh, first I wanted to share with you, just talking on that note about mitigation. So the impacts of carbon on our sea level rise. Um, so, so we're going to start shoop, over on this side. If we continue business as usual, so we're emitting carbon at the same rates that we have been, which is an increasing rate over time we're gonna see a sea level rise of around um, three feet. And this data is a little bit old, so this is higher again now that we know more. Um, but the point I wanted to make with, with these visuals is that the difference between business as usual and the impact on sea level rise and over onto this side, which is an 80% reduction of our carbon by 2050, the difference in sea level rise by 2100 is only one foot. So. Yes, we need to put a lot of effort into mitigation for lots of other reasons, but we still need to prepare our communities to be resilient because it's not going to solve the problem of sea level rise. All right, so here's some solutions that have been happening um, around the world. We have some really amazing river barriers over in Europe, um, largest movable object on the planet, I think is that one, and um, in Miami. This is an example of where they're pumping water out. So keeping the water out is one strategy that you can think of. So we want to keep the water from coming into a place. That's great. It's going to buy you time, but it's not going to last forever because the water is going to get higher than that. So it's a really great kind of first go-to strategy if you're not ready for what's next. What's next is deciding how are we then going to live with the water once it comes past those barriers that we create, or just skip that step and let's go right here. <laughs> so some examples of that, we've got some floating um, communities that, and um, also some buildings here. But a lot of um, folks too are thinking about different landscape features that can happen along the coastlines of cities that are floodable, but when their waters aren't high, how can they also be beautiful public spaces that we can use too? So really, what are the multi-uses that we can um, build into our resiliency measures and making sure that we're using all of our dollars in the, in the most productive way? Um, some other interesting projects that I've heard about that are proposed, too, is thinking about when you build um, new buildings underneath of them, building holding tanks, so that way it can hold a, a lot of the water um, until the tides do go out, so underneath parking garages, for example. And also think about green infrastructure, so when we do have those heavy precipitation events, if it happens during a high tide, how could some green infrastructure absorb some of that extra water? Or can we build in places that can channel the water as well? So another kind of important piece around sea level rise and how we can prepare our communities for resiliency is actually something that you all are doing right now. Um, when you talk with those um, who are working with cities and towns and states who need to make the decision, they really need a lot of public support. So just understanding the issue, how it's going to impact your community and being able to recognize when sea level rise is discussed in the news or dis discussed in things that need to that your town is, um, is talking about, having that public knowledge in a community is a really great support for getting us there to resiliency. So here's just a few examples of how folks are doing that. So you can visualize the impacts of sea level rise on the beach. Um, this is a beach in Australia. They're showing you kind of where that, that tide mark is going to be over time. Um, this is a virtual sea level rise viewer in California. So kind of like the silver viewers out on the coastline or out by Portland headlight, you would look through it and then you're, instead of seeing what you would, what is actually there, you're seeing what that coast would look like with additional water on top with sea level rise. Um, and then behind me is NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer, um, which is a great resource to dig in and to look and see exactly what's happening in your community. And they do have some visualizations there too. So instead of looking at it from a satellite view, you can actually um, see what does that look like from the ground level. And I wanted to share with you a bit about what's happening here. Um, so as part of our sea level rise project here at GMRI, 
Uh, we've partnered with the cities of Portland and South Portland and also Machias. So we're working with their city planners and sustainability officers on trying to best understand how can we help them prepare their communities for sea level rise resiliency. So um, they're doing a lot of work in thinking about this and we're also thinking about, as I mentioned before, how can this program be transferable? So Machias is helping us in that efforts as well. But here in Portland, they're really, as you saw, looking at the Bayside community. And they are, there's a Bayside Adaptation Working Group that um, consists of stakeholders there that are preparing a statement for the city around what it is that their community values and how do they envision transitioning into a community that's experiencing these floods as sea level rises. And the city just launched this design challenge um, that not too long ago, a few weeks ago, they premiered kind of some of the visuals that you can see here where different architecture firms and landscape companies proposed what does the Bayside community look like in 2100 with six feet of sea level rise. So I thought these were really great images to share because it's not all doom and gloom. We're not just going to flood and have to deal with that. We need to change, we need to adapt, and with change, there's opportunity. So by looking outwards to examples, we can really be creative in thinking about how can we transform our spaces to really live with the water. Um, so a lot of these proposals um, took that into account and took into account what the landscape looked like before and maybe reclaiming some of the marshes that we had filled in so that way the water can naturally come in, creating natural barriers to kind of keep the water out. And also the one behind me is showing a gradual, graceful retreat um, from the rising waters and also how to transform that new shoreline. That sandy beach isn't magically going to place itself there. So how do you decommission um, a neighborhood that just can't be there anymore and prepare that new shoreline to be something that um, is valued in the neighborhood? So a lot of opportunity with that change. So with all of that, um, thank you for joining us for the Sea State Lecture and um, want to promote our Sea Level Rise program. So if you're curious about, hey, well, what's going to happen at my place or in my house or in this location, or if you want to dig into any of that data, our Sea Rise Education Program is an interactive experience that happens here in this space. You can see some of the photos from our prototypes of that on the side. And it's an opportunity for you to engage with your neighbors um, and your friends and thinking about specifically how is our neighborhood going to be impacted by sea level rise. You'll get to look at, through the maps yourselves and think about how your different community resources are going to be impacted and um, have discussion as a group around what are some of those resiliency measures that may work best for us. So we have some events coming up that you can see here, and you can find more information on our website. Thank you. Thank you. So we have lots of time for questions, but what I'm going to suggest we do is, is have questions here for about five or ten minutes, and then uh, we'll let people leave, and, and anybody who has additional questions can come in and have a chat with Gail. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Talk Great quickly. So. So, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Terrific question. So that was how far up river? Because we have tidal rivers here in Maine. I lived in Richmond for quite a while. So while I've been doing this, I haven't just been looking out at Casco Bay from my desk. Oh, what's happening here? I've been zooming into Richmond too. What does that look like under the different scenarios? So that's just a couple towns down from Augusta. Um, so a lot of those coastal rivers are going to experience that flood as well. And if you're looking at those towns, there's definitely a lot of infrastructure that's going to be impacted. If you think about the downtown that's in Hollowell, or Gardner, for example, um, a lot of their infrastructure and docks. I know in Richmond their wastewater treatment plant is right on the river too. So it's definitely something that the towns along those um, tidal rivers are going to need to be thinking about. They're not going to have as much of the impact that we get when we see storm surge on top of sea level rise, but um, they will experience it with sea level rise. 
not just a coastal problem. <laughs> yes? Uh, there's a lot of basically commercial space down in the Bay Side. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have any communication with the architects or planning? I mean, is this stuff that could be built on stilts or have those parking garages? Or the, are, are the people who are investing in yeah. this area, are, do they have any consciousness of what is going on? Yeah, great question. So I was around the infrastructure that is kind of coming in the up and coming developments of Bayside. Um, I mentioned before, um, Bayside has a Bayside Adapts working group. So the city has, is working with um, uh, the Muskie Schools Finance Center to facilitate this group of stakeholders that either already own a lot of development or are head of the Housing Authority or Portland Trails is on the board. The neighborhood associations are a part of that as well. And that's to understand how do we envision Bayside as a community and what we value right now and how is that going to transition into the future not just with the development, but specifically with rising seas as well. Um, so in talk, I can't speak for themselves, but in conversations that I have had with um, those on the planning boards in Portland and our waterfront coordinator, it's definitely something that they're thinking about and wanting to support um, any infrastructure that goes in there that they are planning for how do we create this um, floodable infrastructure, or what does the city need to change in order to support that? And a lot of the discussion is around um, what's a private action that's needed to take and what is the public action and where is the money um, come from. But it's definitely a part of the biggest, like the big conversation as a whole <laughs> and, and getting those people at the, at the table together is really important. But um, next time you're driving down uh, Marginal Way, take a look at like the Intermed building. They have parking on the first floor, so that was done purposefully, so that one can flood, as well as the um, apartments that are, uh, apartment building that's next to it, too. So a lot of the structures are already built to withstand some of that, of that flooding that we see. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned the floodable garages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, does that really have a financial impact on, on you? Or? Um, well, for a floodable garage, like, are, were, were you yeah, talking so, uh, about the, you the about tank the, like, beneath, or? We, we had like six tides of flooding back in. The Patriot State Storm. Patriot State yeah. Storm. Like, would floodable garages really be able to have a sizable impact on that? It seems like a, a small measure against. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's not like one fix for this, definitely not. I think there's a lot of things that need to come into play for resilience. But when you're seeing a big storm come through, um, instead of having everything is damaged and gone, you're just you're reducing the impacts. You're not going to ever have no impacts when you see a storm like that come through. Um, so yeah, those tanks can hold some water or creating structures that can have water pass through without damage is going to help. But with the big storms on top of sea level rise, it's just going to minimize the damage. Yeah. Uh, yep. So using Bayside as, as, as an example, mm -hmm. uh, have the uh, have the hundred year flood maps put out by FEMA begun to recognize the possible rise in sea level? Great. Yeah. So FEMA is actually redoing their flood maps for the Portland area, and they're go they're going to be coming out soon. Yeah, so FEMA is redoing their um, current 100-year <coughs> flood maps for this area. So we'll see what the impacts are and um, as those get rolled out. An example yes. that might be helpful to answer that is Lincoln County has prepared using the FEMA, the new FEMA maps, working with some students at Bowdoin have diagrammed what the potentials could be. They're interactive maps, and if you go on the Lincoln County Regional Planning Commission website, uh, they're there. Right. Last night, I live on Southport Avenue, and yeah. last night our county engineer proposed uh, changes in ordinances. Um, and this all came about because five, four years ago, Dan Estrada looked at changes upriver, mm -hmm. and uh, the town laughed at him. And oh, wow. now people are listening. So it's just been a few years. But uh, the Lincoln County Regional Planning Commission is ahead of the game on this. Great. But what is needed, and so my question for yes. you is going to be, we need a network of people who are trained in 
Mm -hmm. Very hard. We, we're out searching for a planner right now. Very hard to do that because people don't have the ability to express their expertise. You don't know where to go. So running a network of some sort Great. Uh, for you folks might be an idea down the road. Yeah, and so part of my work over the past 18 months, too, has been connecting with the folks that are doing this work. So Maine has... Um, Climate change adaptation providers. Sorry to go through the acronym in my head. There's a lot. <laughs> um, but that's a, a great network in Maine of folks that are working towards um, how do we adapt our communities. And like I, as I talked through the resiliency measures, uh, the big piece is having the conversations and getting those experts at the table to understand exactly what are those specific impacts on the community and what is it that they envision for themselves in the future. So getting the right people at the table at the right time when when the town is ready for it is, is difficult. So there, there is a network in Maine that is supporting that, um, but definitely much more effort is needed there. Yes? Are there similar groups and initiatives underway in South Portland, similar to what you described to Oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, we're working with the cities of Portland and South Portland. And South Portland is actually launching um, uh, they're redoing their sustainability plan. So you'll see an invite for a sea level rise program specifically for South Portland. Um, I think they, they have one scheduled for February. Yep. Yes? Uh, a group here in Portland, headed by Sam Merrill, mm -hmm. has been in the vanguard of assessing actual, applying actual costs to various levels of sea level rise and various adaptation measures. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So I, I breezed through a really kind of extensive piece of our program, the Sea Level Rise program, which is thinking about the community resources. So um, just to give you an outline of what the Sea Level Rise program will be, is a quick introduction to Sea Level Rise, a little bit less than what you guys got today. And then folks will get to explore their own places on maps and how those different Sea Level Rise scenarios play out. And then what are the impacts once we have storms on top of sea level rise? So to be able to look at the data that way. Um, and that part is interactive, happening in small groups. Um, and then we'll have a discussion around that. And then, again, to work in small groups to look at different community resource maps. So whether it's housing or infrastructure or working waterfront, transportation, public spaces, wildlife habitat. Um, an opportunity to choose what it is that you value and how are, how are those specific things going to be impacted by sea level rise. So that's where we'll be incorporating tools that already exist, such as the one that you mentioned by um, Sam Merrill around. Um, it's a really neat tool that can show you where are the highest kind of costs of, of those impacts. Um, like we see it, saw the most water coming into Bayside, but there's not as much money in the infrastructure there as there is when you're looking at Commercial Street. That's where a lot of the value in our infrastructure is going to be lost. Um, so how do we think about those? So that part of the program will give, give you an opportunity to look at that data in an interactive way, and then we'll talk about resiliency measures. So one more question. Yeah. OK. Yeah. It's you. Great. <laughs> Yes. And some of the locations that I know, like 17 feet above sea level, show themselves as flooded. So I, how is that? Yeah. They get flooded at 3.3 feet if they're actually 17 feet above sea level. Interesting. So this is a bathtub model. And so it, it's not going to be, it may not be completely accurate. There may have been um, some places that are just right beside where our highest elevation is, and that's where the measurement was taken of the elevation. It may not have happened at that 17.7, but just really close around it. So then when you do the overlay of the water and it smooths it out, so it's, the resolution might not be as precise as that. Okay. Welcome. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, so hopefully that will be fun. Um, but uh, the other thing I'd like to uh, I'd like to invite you to do is to uh, consider supporting our work. So we rely on the contributions of people like you. It's something that uh, is very important for uh, for us to be able to run this lecture series and to support some of the other uh, other programs that we run. Uh, so there are several ways you can do that. Obviously, we would love to have uh, uh, have a donation, which you can do online or you can pick up an envelope outside. But if you'd just like to stay connected with us, we would also really value that as well because we need your ideas and your energy. Uh, so please consider signing up for our mailing list, uh, signing up for our uh, for our lecture series, uh, and also we have a lunch and learn uh, experience that we offer on the first Thursday of every month, uh, and you can get some more information uh, outside or on our website. So. Thank you very much. And, and sea level rise events. And oh yes, and these yes. wonderful sea level rise events as well. Uh, we, we need to get some flyers. And I know. Get the us website's those. being launched tomorrow morning. Okay, so stay tuned <laughs> for the website. Great. Uh, and I hope all of you have a great summer, and I hope to.